So we are moving right into the next topic, very important topic of climate justice and just transition. And uh, this topic, of course, has multiple layers and perspectives. So there's, of course, the distributional implications of the climate transition and of climate impacts, for example, on household income, on energy, uh, poverty, and other factors. There's the dimension of uh, regions being affected by the transition, for example, um, regions that are traditionally coal producing regions. But there's also the um, perspective and um, topic of climate justice um, between countries, the question of loss and damage and what would be fair efforts. And in this session, we try to, to look at the topic from, from a variety of angles. Um, and so I'm really happy to introduce to you uh, three uh, great speakers uh, for this session. We have uh, in the beginning, Johannes Emmerling, um, uh, who is uh, a senior scientist um, working on integrated assessment since uh, since a long time, energy economics, climate economics, um, um, and is currently also leading a model comparison project on inequality impacts of the climate transition in the Navigate project. This will be followed by uh, Sarita um, uh, um, at Nice, who is looking into questions of energy uh, transition in, in Asia and, and also questions of energy policy and security. And finally, we will have Ben Sovakol, uh, who is uh, working uh, uh, since a long time on question of energy security policy and uh, uh, equity. So let me uh, give the word to you, um, Johannes, um, to give us an introduction on what IEMs are currently doing in this space. Okay, yes, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, um, Elma, for the presentation. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, as as said, I, I uh, for this presentation, I thought a bit about uh, what what IEMs have been doing in the past uh, related to the trust transition um, uh, idea or movement, which is is has now taken up quite quite some some movement over the last years. And so I organized it around the three parts of of just transition that that have been found important. And that is uh, the different types of justice. So the first one that, that uh, Elmer just mentioned is the distribution of justice, which is important on inequality, employment, etc. Then the second part of just transition is basically the procedural justice, how 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 basically the transition is managed, the institutional questions. And uh, the third part that has been discussed being part of this is the restorative justice or kind of a, a compensation of injustice compensation. And uh, I, I thought in, in these three areas, IEMs have done have done some work over the last um, over the last decade. And also uh, clearly linked to this this part is kind of that the, the unequal effects across different geographical scales is really at the at the core of just transition, not only locally but uh, nationally and internationally. And so IEMs of of different uh, different types have addressed these different scales, um, I think, quite quite well. And when I think a bit about what that have what work has been done in these areas, I think especially the part on on the first one on the distribution of justice has of course seen a lot of applications, uh, especially over the last years. And I've seen uh, quite a few presentations also this year uh, on employment, the role of distributional implication of climate policies, uh, and also impacts recently, and the role of energy access, energy poverty, and well-being. Um, the part related to, to procedural justice is, has been less, has received less attention, at least in, in the IM world. So there's not so much on, on how, how basically the transition can be managed from a more uh, institutional point of view. However, recently, yeah, especially the looking at institutional um, feasibility or, or, or also governance related to climate uh, scenarios, I think has, has, has brought some interesting insights there. So I would say there's an increasing uh, focus also on this part. And and uh, finally, on the on the role of restoration or compensation, that uh, was also like like Vicky mentioned before. Of course, the compensation has become uh, even more increasingly important over the last years. Uh, so this is at the international scale, the burden sharing, uh, loss and damage, etc. But also within regions. Um, so there's let's say an an intermediate, um, as I see it at least, um, work that that IEMs have produced over the last years. I wanted to just give some sh snapshots of some recent works of at our institute and, and others on that are that are related. Just a few minutes um, on on ongoing work. 
So, um, of course, trust and fitness started with the, the employment factor. And here, for instance, a study that we currently also present at the poster here is the employment in energy system in, in Europe. And we see a large sector of, of coal jobs, for instance, in some regions like, like Poland uh, and, and other countries. And even within countries, the, the regional distribution matters. So I think here, even the subnational uh, modeling effort, and we've seen this, for instance, in, uh, in, in South Africa, but also in Poland, the subnational model doing really a, a great work on, on identifying these losers uh, or in, in terms of employment. Now, you're looking only at energy system and, and scenarios, energy uh, and emission projections, of course, doesn't tell you a lot about the, the level of the, the gravity of the problem in some sense. So for instance, here then we look at what is the share of the workforce affected. Uh, and here, for instance, we look at, let's say, what of the 1% of the workforce in a given country uh, would potentially lose their job by 2050. Uh, and we find here that there's a large discrepancy across countries and really highlighting the, the kind of the red area where we're really um, uh, uh, trust and Jason plays an important role. And so I think uh, focusing on the population dimensions are really not only on the macro aggregates, but really looking also what, what type and what uh, share of the population is affected is one important uh, part to, to, to study maybe in the, in the future a bit more. On the distributional incidents, uh, Elma also mentioned this, uh, there has been of course, quite a lot of work uh, um, on over the last uh, couple of years on, on the, uh, the regressivity of carbon pricing, etc. This is a, a very recent work with the um, <clears throat> cost-benefit uh, IEM that we've been performing. And uh, again, also here we find abatement is typically regressive. But um, the, here the important part, I think, is also to include the uh, impacts uh, and potential adaptation. And because also impacts, of course, have been found that, uh, that uh, are potentially quite regressive, uh, vulnerability being, uh, being uh, not equally distributed across populations. So therefore, the, the combined effect of a climate policy and the combined uh, uh, regressivity or distributional impact is not clear. And, and moreover, bringing uh, net transfers or compensation schemes to the picture can really change the picture quite a bit. Um, so I think it's it's important to study these uh, points um, um, together, not only the climate policy incidents, uh, but also take into account impacts and potential compensation schemes um, in in this in this case. And the third part, again, always on the distributional aspect of justice, I think uh, there's been a lot of work. And here, this is an example by uh, a great paper by Jarmo Kikstra on, on energy access and decent living. So here, I think the, the important factor is to look at the, the population. So not only to focus on country aggregates again, but really seeing what part of the population is affected by, uh, by, different, by different policies uh, or by different categories, for instance, energy access, but also other types of um, uh, here, decent living. Uh, indicators. Also here, I think the, the spatial resolution is really something that uh, that uh, is has been improved over the last years, and I think there's really some scope with in, increased data access uh, to to this even further because there are really hotspots typically in, in several of these categories uh, that really define um, the justice perception um, <clears throat> at, the, at the at the local level of of the population. So overall, I think here in this part, it's, it has been quite some, some, uh, some, some progress. Uh, a second part, layer just focusing also on, on welfare. I mean, many models model welfare or maximize welfare, but I think welfare and well-being is still, uh, let's say, captured relatively um, uh, simplistic in many models. I think here, approving, improving well-being, uh, looking, for instance, including at that subjective well-being. We know, for instance, unemployment has been found. It's, it's of course, negatively correlated to, to well-being, so, so uh, it matters, etc. Uh, there's also the concept of well-being uh, life years. Uh, different measures have been proposed over the last years that, that might be also be used in, in IEMs. Um, Yes, feasibility of, of pathways. This is, I think, the only part where procedural justice is being tackled. Uh, I think very interesting work here by, by, by Bruchin et al. Looking at institutional um, feasibility of different scenarios. And uh, with that, for the sake of time, um, the final plot is, again, uh, I think, focusing on the population. Here we focus on what population benefits or, or loses from a climate policy. Um, it really tells you how, how much, let's say, uh, different populations are affected uh, 
um, by 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 wind by climate policies and climate impacts, and I think this this is important to understand uh, in this in this context. Uh, let me not go to the international part, which I think will be covered in in the next presentations. And just to conclude, uh, I think yeah, subnational disaggregated households. There's a lot of modeling, but this is really needed, and welfare and well-being well-being um, representation should be is still something that we can improve on and foc focusing on the population uh, affected uh, at the as possible as a granular space. I think that's really key issues for we're really understanding just transition. And IAM scams definitely uh, help uh, in this direction a lot. With that being said, um, happy to have any questions after the maybe next presentations. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Push, now it works. Thanks a lot, Johannes Peck. This information, uh, lots of things being done by the community in this area. So let's move to Sarita, offering a perspective from developing countries. Developing countries. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Johannes. It was it had a lot of results and everything. So I would go the other way, talking about uh, narratives and maybe from a policy implementation perspective. So it's a lot to take on. So I'll just start and, uh, um, okay. Um, just to provide a context. So we are talking about the historical contributions of cumulative GHG emissions. And I would like to present the developing countries perspective, which till now we do not have that much of a carbon footprint, but in future we will. Uh, and just keeping in mind that urban areas are home to more than half of the population now. And in future, uh, we uh, in Asia and Africa, that's India, China, Nigeria alone, would be responsible for 35% of the growth. But what I want to show over here are the impacts. And one can see the impacts are around the equatorial and tropic of cancer area which are many of the developing, where many of the developing countries are located. And keeping that in mind, we are not only talking when we talk about climate justice about the Anthropocene, but the natural systems. Uh, at a spatial level, we are talking about the global, regional, national, subnational cities, as well as villages that are impacted. Temporal, obviously the past already happened. It's a current and the future, how we go would be I would be focusing on uh, systems. So in models, we talk about efficiency, we talk about cost optimization. Right now there's a little bit of discussion about equality, equity, I don't know. I mean, it needs to be better understood how equity comes into modeling. So there needs to be much more work that needs to be done. And when we talk about economies, uh, we are talking about not only the planned, the production and consumer economies. So India would be the third largest consumer economy in the coming future. We are talking about not only develop, but developing transitions, the emerging economies that are coming out. Uh, here, we need to note that we are not the G7, G20, but we are almost more than 200 countries at various degrees of de development, various degrees of capacity building and governance. So that needs to keep in mind. And when they are talking, we are talking about distributional, procedural, corrective, restorative transition, but substantive, that is something which actually happens in the real world. And that needs to be talked about and discussed more than it is. And who is left behind? So we talk about the low income communities, but what about the minorities? It's not only about race, but caste, uh, indigenous people, people with disabilities, old people, young people, intergenerational people, women, future generation. I think in Native American communities, um, there is uh, uh, there is kind of a story where there is a representation of a future generation when there are discussions about future that are made. So why don't we have someone who is representing the future generation and talking on their basis when we are doing this modeling exercises. Um, just to give a, a, a 
a perspective about G20 because from today, India would has taken the presidentship of G20 countries from Indonesia. So we have about 137 countries that have committed to net zero and G20 countries uh, basically emit uh 75 percent have 75 percent of the emissions shares uh, almost 80 percent of the gdp in purchasing power parity and 66 percent of the population keeping that in mind the ones in yellow are the g20 countries and what i have highlighted in green are the countries that have just energy transition plan and that's just mexico and south africa so the other g20 countries like it is still in discussion, especially in the de developing countries. And this is the subsidies that we are talking about. So China itself has about $800 billion of subsidies in the last five years that it has basically uh, implemented uh, on fossil fuels. Keeping this in mind, we also look at the climate risk exposures among the developing countries. And one can see that in terms of central bank climate stress, the risk exposure that's looked into, it's just by Brazil. Only few countries have looked into the uh, climate uh, disclosures and uh, have environmental taxonomies, the green taxonomies uh, fully developed or implemented, but these are in uh, uh, discussion stage. So, when we talk about just energy transitions, I will not take a lot of time on this. We are talking about the systems transfer transformations, the benefits, the trade-offs, the accountability, multiple governance that need to be involved, not only country level, uh, in between countries, and basically finance. So when we are talking about JetP, finance is basically uh, uh, the most discussed for enabling the mobilization of these transitions. Uh, so we have the South African uh, example of the $8.5 billion uh, that has been uh, uh, finalized between the South Africa and the uh, IPG group, the International Partners Group. Uh, similarly, I, um, from a South African perspective in the last year, they have come, uh, they have developed an investment plan of how to invest this uh, uh, um, uh, money that they have got. And then uh, I think last month, Indonesia also basically uh, came up with the uh, JetP and has uh, 10 billion public money that would be mobilized through uh, public money and another 10 billion through privatized the Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. Uh, there are talks uh, in coal producing countries like India, Vietnam, oil and gas, Nigeria. And what's interesting is a future gas producing country, that's Senegal, uh, of having such jet B programs. So this is from a planning perspective. Uh, when it comes to stakeholder engagement, India is in a process of engaging with the coal stakeholders in the entire coal value chain. And we did that over the last two years. We engaged with more than 250 stakeholders nationally and internationally, 60% from government sector and uh, about 40% from the private sector. And what were the key messages? So India may achieve net zero, but we require the development space. These are what this is what the stakeholders are saying. We are talking about the energy security, but we are also talking about self-sufficiency. So coal may remain in India for the next couple of decades. From a climate security perspective, we are updating our NDCs and have committed towards net zero. Uh, there is talk about decarbonization of power sector, but also we need to decarbonize our industry sector if we need to move towards the net zero goal of 2070. The use of revenue, where does that revenue come from? It's not only from India, we need the international finance for these transitions. And um, all the stakeholders are discussing about having a social dialogue in this transitional planning. But what was interesting in India was we have maybe 5 million that we talk about in the coal transitions value chain, but we have about 20 million uh, new generation that is coming in. So we are not basically looking at jobs that are already there, 
we are we also have to think about the future job india is the youngest population uh, with 29 average age uh, compared to i think 37 in china and 48 in japan so we need to keep that in mind and also labor so just giving you an example of uh, discussion with the labor union they also are aware that the transitions would take place and an example i just want to put forward uh, which i did yesterday was they are aware that this needs to happen and they want to be part of these transitions. So that is really uh, um, very good to hear, basically. Um, from India's perspective, G20 uh, lifestyle for environment. So here's there's a lot of discussion how much energy developing countries should reach, like what is the optimum, the Pareto or whatever. On the other hand, I would like to ask developed countries, how much can you reduce the energy consumption that is already there? When we are talking about electricity per capita, India is around 1,000 kilowatt per capita. Canada is 16 times of India's electricity per capita. US is 12 times. So could you reduce that by half? Can it come to 6,000 kilowatt per capita? Those are the questions that need to be asked. There are multiple voices and de various degrees of development that needs to be taken into consideration. Still, India would talk about one earth, one value, uh, one family towards one vision. So we have a uh, saying, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So basically having taking together everyone, no one is left behind. So we are not talking G20, we are talking about all inclusive when we are talking about these actions. Um, we will focus on solution spaces. Obviously, the problem is quite obvious. And then uh, talking not only about climate finance, but adaptation finance, which is equally important because India would, has one of the largest informal economies and climate impacts are already impacting these um, income levels. And obviously looking at uh, low cost finance, and that is really important. So I'll just talk about the need for plurality not only in voices, but uh, from social science and sciences perspective, but also we are looking, taking all the stakeholders into consideration. So that is required. We are not talking about only individuals. We need to consider what our identity is, what our biases are, what our experiences are, uh, along with the community and the nation and its aspirations. And just to say that uh, um, our first prime minister basically actually believed in science and helped uh, basically approve many of the uh, projects when it came to science and technology, especially the space program, which was kind of looked out like, why would a poor country want to invest in its science program? And just to say, I really believe that we all are in the gutter, but we all have, um, uh, some of us always look towards the star. And just to show that uh, our first space program, we were basically transporting um, uh, the things on a bicycle to being one of the low cost space programs who basically uh, sent a program to Mars, sent a satellite to Mars. So it's, Things can happen at low cost is something I want to say. And there was one comment that was made by the prime minister that uh, the amount we spent on our space program to Mars was less than the amount uh, that was spent on Gravity, the movie, which was about 100 million. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our last speaker is Ben Sovakol, Professor for Energy Policy in Sussex. Ben, you are online. Great. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, it's going to be a bit of a switch in tempo. I think initially people had talked about trying to talk more about how we could incorporate climate and energy justice into models. But my understanding of maths is really, really poor. I mean, my family even jokes I can't even add and subtract numbers properly. So I thought I would pivot a little bit and give you... its new frontiers are, and then finally connected a little bit to uh, modeling. So energy justice, because I realize many of you um, probably have seen the term climate justice, um, environmental justice. Hmm. By the way, I keep getting an air. Ben. 
We, we cannot hear you uh, well and you are freezing up from time to time. Maybe you can switch off your video. And then let's try again. Very strange. I got an error message from Zoom that Zoom stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll try it again. Let's try it again. If you want to switch off your video, um, because the connection doesn't seem to be very stable. Let's do that. All right. OK, so we'll go back to the beginning. Uh, and that was just to say, initially, we were talking about having a presentation that would focus more on how to integrate energy justice into modeling. But um, my knowledge of modeling is really poor. My knowledge of math is really poor. So I instead wanted to give a talk that's more about uh, state of the art and where we are in energy justice thinking and what it might mean for modeling uh, and ways we might be able to find really good synergies and connections. So I thought I would start with a very high level. You all have seen these terms, climate justice, and many of you have seen the terms environmental justice. Maybe fewer of you have seen the term energy justice, and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, do we need another justice? Um, but I do think there's something distinctive about energy justice. And, and that's why a lot of my work has really tried to brand itself around energy justice rather than the others. And that's because it really does focus on the costs and benefits of energy systems, whether it's co-benefits or co-impacts or externalities, positive and negative, or even things like ownership, quality of access, quality of resources. But it also is a nice way of bringing in governance issues, procedural governance, free prior informed consent, impartiality, representativeness, inclusion. And finally, about vulnerable groups with a recognition for those who have been dispossessed or harmed, especially indigenous communities, ethnic minorities, uh, the homeless, refugees, single families, you know, uh, children, the elderly. And uh, we did a paper about five years ago that tried to chart six new frontiers. And my sense here in 2022 is that all six of the frontiers still hold. So this is kind of where we've tried to push the energy justice community to go. Uh, we want them to use non-Western theories of justice. It's not just about Kant and Rawls and human rights and libertarianism, but it's also about, say, Ubuntu or Buddhism. Um, or indigenous perspectives on justice, or feminist, anti-racist, anti-colonialist notions of justice, so we can get out of this frame of just distribution, or just frame of just equity or capabilities. We really have difficulty with non-human-centered notions of justice. I'm not sure how we would ever model these, um, but it would at least give a respect towards environmental ethics, animal-centric and eco-centric notions of justice. Cross-scalar issues, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, the co-benefits of justice. So when you do justice, does it also deliver resilience or efficiency or financial savings? Um, who wins and loses when we do just intervention? So even just transition could still have net losers or at least some losers in particular parts of the economy. And finally, justice itself is very dangerous because it's, it's rhetoric, it's performance, and it's this powerful performance. And people really get upset when you talk about things in justice terms. And so we have to be careful uh, to, to kind of make sure we, we respect the fact that justice itself can be hegemonic and colonialist in certain ways if used to moralize or, or judge other people. Um, we led a whole Inapaths project that was on the two that just actually lit up in purple, which was cross-scalar issues and political economy issues. To give you a sense for what this frontier looks like, uh, Noel Healy did this great article on the embodied energy injustices uh, for coal. And the kind of argument was that in focusing just on the coal-fired power plant, which is that box where we do the environmental impact statement at the site of combustion, we're missing and obscuring all these other elements throughout coal's life cycle that become sacrifice zones. And we repeated this to kind of ask, well, what about low carbon options? What about nuclear power in France and solar power in Germany and battery electric vehicles in Norway and smart meters for gas and electricity in Great Britain? And using a qualitative mixed methods research design of expert interviews and focus groups and talking to members of the public uh, on internet forums, uh, we used a similar whole systems approach uh, that looked at different uh, geographic scales. So the micro, the meso, and the macro, as well as different phases of a transition from its material inputs and manufacturing and construction to its use and consumption, all the way to um, its afterlife with disposal and waste. And what's quite striking is that from a multi-scalar perspective, look at this top row, <clears throat> of the macro scale impacts, everywhere in red 
is a place identified from our data as being impacted negatively with injustice from four European transitions. So for European energy transitions cascade across North America in terms of you know, uh, decreasing the viability of tar sands or South America, externalities of lithium mining or Sub-Saharan Africa, cobalt and copper mining uh, to things like interference with LNG exports in Australia to forced labor in supply chains for solar in China uh, to dirty cars fleeing Europe as we decarbonize to head towards Eastern Europe or Russia um, or China. As part of this study as well, and this is very relevant for modelers, we also asked about the co-benefits. So we didn't just ask what are the injustices, we also asked what are the benefits, it's one of our warm-up questions in our interviews. And the supported by tab just means RI is research interview, IF is internet forum, FG is focus group. So we created these beautiful tables because uh, we did content analysis of all of our data. Um, and check this out. With those four transitions, we also get 128 co-benefits, 128 from four different low carbon transitions. But here's where it gets very interesting for modelers. Um, many of these we could model, like the economicness of fuel savings or profits and revenues. And of course, many earth systems modelers and even integrated assessment modelers are quite good at modeling air pollution, and PM 2.5 and SOX and NOx and carbon and methane. Um, what do we do about some of the other ones that may be more difficult to model, like the social benefits, like pride or people not feeling guilty? Uh, when they choose to adopt a, a new innovation. Same with um, some of the more like technical benefits like um, improved patterns of innovation beyond patents or spillovers, positive spillovers like Germany shaping Chinese production of solar. And what about the political ones um, like reducing energy dependence, right? Or policy learning or even political patronage. Um, so it really does kind of um, indicate, uh, I guess, difficult domains in justice that are kind of difficult to monetize and therefore difficult to model. More recently, as in last year, I wanted to touch this study quickly to show you some gaps in where we are with our geography transitions and justice work. So this is a large scale review of um, 332 case studies, 20 years of work ending in 2020, 198 studies, mostly in political science, energy transitions, carbon transitions, climate policy, and um, different geog geography journals. And this just kind of shows you, I guess, lacuna and problems with this body of research. For instance, uh, it didn't have a lot of interdisciplinary teams. It didn't include a lot of non-social scientists. It didn't do a lot of rigorous work, which was mixed methods or longitudinal or comparative work. Um, it tended to focus on the high tech, not the low tech not bicycles and cook stoves and light bulbs, and instead looked at nuclear reactors and you know, high altitude wind turbines. Um, very, very few whole systems and multi-scalar approaches and very, very few that actually engage with policy. So this is kind of a nice proxy of kind of some of the drawbacks to a lot of the ongoing justice work, at least within these different disciplines. And I really wanna focus on this multi-scalar one because it, it not only is close to my heart, but I think it really connects well with modeling because integrated assessment models are especially supposed to be global and are supposed to capture impacts. And this shows you from that review. So the same 198 studies, the end shows you the number of studies which focused on each scale. So you can see a, a kind of, not bias, but at least a preponderance of studies that focus only on policy or only on operation and use. Only a handful, less than 12% looked at disposal and waste. Um, and very few looked at manufacturing or resource extraction. And then when you add them up together, only four studies out of 198 looked at more, more than four scales. So truly a whole systems work is incredibly rare, perhaps because of its cost or complexity, or we lack the research design tools to do it well. So to conclude, I really do think that, you know, the modeling communities, uh, we need to get a better handle on some research designs that are capable of understanding many of the non-modelable co-benefits of innovation and transitions, whether it's the social ones, the political ones, pride, guilt, prestige, political patronage. I don't know how we do that. We also found in our work that some of the innovations get coupled together. So it's a mistake to say model heat pumps or solar or EVs in isolation when they may actually occur together or be co-adopted or co-installed in a whole house retrofit. So this is quite challenging. It's moving to portfolios of coupled systems rather than isolated technologies. 
also the injustices, the different dimensions of them and the different um, the different co-benefits also means that they're not just economic, right? So we should probably quit obsessing over only carbon taxes, economic instruments, right? If if it's social and political dimensions, we need social and political instruments to complement economic and technical instruments. Um, and I think how in the world the IAM community starts to get a handle on multi-systems injustices and multi-scalar injustices with rigor is also very, very difficult. It's even difficult qualitatively. Um, uh, and how do we also avoid kind of mission creep where then you're modeling everything um, and you have to account for too many variables to be of any use. And lastly, I want to kind of open up an invitation. Qual qualitative social scientists do not have a monopoly on energy justice work. I very, very would much want greater inclusion and refinement from the modeling community, the natural and physical sciences, and the modeling community, especially given some of the flaws that I identified with social science work, lack of rigor, lack of generalizability, a focus on isolated scales, and a focus on technologies like wind and solar and EVs, and not focusing on other important technologies like microhydro or cookstoves. And I think that this refinement is very welcome for the modeling community as you can help us understand better demographic dimensions of transitions, better spatial justice impacts, better intergenerational impacts, uh, impacts on non-human forms of life, even elements uh, of kind of the discursive dimensions of, of how energy justice is, is kind of utilized in different policy regimes. And then intersections among all of these, because demography can shape space, which can shape time, which can shape discourse. And so we have also relational perspectives that are capable of capturing the intersections, interstitches of these different dimensions. Um, and I think it's also not just the job of us modelers and scientists, but also those beyond the academy. Uh, and this is kind of a call for inclusion where we can couple modeling and science with say youth activism, with uh, civil society, with uh, entrepreneurship and business models and other forms of innovation. Um, so please consider this lastly, a call to arms to join us in energy justice work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's now open up for, for questions and comments. We are running a bit late, but maybe we can also run a couple of minutes. Over to you. Any, any thoughts, reflections, questions to the speakers? Jen. Hi, uh, that's Chris from Boston Institute of Climate Impact Research. On the in, like, topic of international collaboration, um, do you think in the case of India or other developing countries, like, do we need to scale up the role of foreign direct investment? Because that's sort of where the, the, the space so far under which sort of finance and technological transfer happens between develop and developing countries. And is there a space for sort of um, technological active diffusion in a sense, sort of, we also see that with sort of vaccine presidents where WTO gave, gave green light for developing countries to produce vaccines without patents. Like, is there some, some lessons to be learned there? So actually I would like to collect a few questions before I give it back to the panel. Steve. Just maybe the panel could comment. It, it, maybe there's a bit of a connection here between, because just tech, tech transitions is, is a lot about how you go along these pathways and how you implement. And we also have a challenge in this modeling community of, especially in the near term, how do we on the ground model these transitions? And it's very difficult. And it seems like maybe these two are connected. And let me add one more question, but, but uh, maybe directed to you, Ben. I mean, you pointed out on your last slide that uh, we should move away from just looking also in individual technologies and, and operations and activities with regard to their political acceptability, but also their uh, inequality implications. Obviously, our community is about integrated pathways. So that's our business. We are not talking about individual technologies. We are offering an integrated view on a pathway. And... Uh, there seems to be a point of connection that 
this research on acceptability on on inequality also from the bottom up from social science using these pathways as objects rather than individual um, um, technologies or activities so would, would like to hear your thoughts about that and with that let let me give it back to uh, to the panel maybe sarita um, if i start with you um and then i move on yeah uh, thank you for the question. So yeah, when it comes to the international collaboration very much and COVID vaccine, uh, the process that India did is an example where we not only took technology from outside, but then we also helped distribute the vaccine to other South uh, global South countries. And this is what we are planning to basically do for in the International Solar Alliance, which India is leading, as well as the leadership for industry transitions, where we are looking at technologies, this duper suite of technologies, and then how can we have these technologies at low cost and also basically uh, transfer and diffuse to other South countries. So from an implementation perspective, that is uh, uh, we are looking at from a international and modeling. Definitely there are collaborations happening and something we discussed in the scientific working group on national scenarios. So one is collecting information. The second is capacity building in many of the countries. And we are not talking about Asia. We are also talking about Africa where the capacities have, are not there or if they are there, it's short term. So how to build this long term capacities in these countries, uh, not only for modeling, but mixed methods and stakeholder engagement, which is very much uh, helpful. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing. So many when um, I was part of few discussions, but definitely from a just transitions perspective, um, Africans are aware uh, um, at the leadership level about the um, uh, transfer of money and how it can impact them as such. So they are they are also trying to see how to implement them. And that is where it is basically really difficult. And one of the things uh, I think at a COPE event that was discussed was uh, instead of just the technology transfer, can these mechanisms also be used for debt swapping? Because many of these South African countries have a lot of debt. So can these, uh, when we talk about finance, uh, these kind of mechanisms also be taken into consideration. So those are certain things, not only from a technology diffusion perspective, but also these other things that are required. Um, I, I, also one more. Uh, in Indonesia, for example, uh, and what I'm looking at, because I'm looking at the industry in Asia, is not be resource export countries but build their own manufacturing industries. And that helps basically de develop their own uh, GDP and wealth. So that is also something that is being discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Sarita. Ben, let me move on to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, just two reflections. The first on international collaborations. I think that they're a key part of a lot of our work. So all that multi-site work we did did mean we had teams going to the Congo. Uh, where they have cobalt mining teams going to uh, Ben, let me let me yeah. oops just interrupt you we can't hear you very well maybe can we turn up the volume a bit so that we can hear him better i speak very loudly so it's like the first time anyone's ever not that sounds that. better <laughs> okay i'll keep going um in terms of international collaboration, I fully agree that like co-creating the research with communities, especially for multi-scalar work is really important, although it can be expensive. However, we also need to realize that a large part of the world lives in what are called non-weird countries. So they're not W-E-I-R-D, Western Educated Rich Industrialized Democracies. And in many of those countries, it's not capable for researchers to criticize their own government safely, like China or the DRC or Saudi Arabia or Russia. So there could be situations oddly where your global positionality could help protect you and you can speak out against things that local researchers can't. Um, so there is a weird dynamic with balancing inclusion with what's politically possible in some of these regimes. Um, your other point about integrated modeling is completely taken. I, I'm more talking about studies that I see as an editor all the time by modelers that are just one technology at a time. EVs in Germany heat pumps in California, 
right? With very little sense of the kind of interaction effects with other technologies. I know that really good modelers like you all tend not to do that. Uh, so my, my critique was really aimed at, at I guess, uh, non-integrated modeling. Great, thanks. Johannes. Yeah, thanks. Maybe just uh, two, two very quick points. Um, uh, one on the on this on the matter of scales that was in all the three presentations on the question that uh, I think really the, the improvement of scales beyond uh, in, income distribution taking into account gender race uh, urban rural divide etc I think that's really crucial and and this is possible and and I think you know, move, move, models moving there so I think there's really a, a room for IEMs in this part of the local justice analysis and secondly regarding to the let's say the positive benefits or, or the like uh, like uh, like Ben showed uh, the different kind of companions Benefits and and co co impacts. I think yeah, some of them. Uh, it it would be uh, we can from the model we can disentangle losses and and benefits in some energy uh, technologies or, or or others, other factors, and then look at them in detail because we typically sum up things like looking at the policy cost, uh, a GDP effect, or a change in end total energy demand. Uh, but if we disentangle the changes in the, in the in the underlying aggregates, and we have the data, uh, for instance, uh, looking at the AR6 database or or modeling results, I think we can connect them to some of the, um, the co-benefits that matter or, or co-impacts that you mentioned. And the, I, I also see that there's a great uh, fruitful uh, collaboration in, in this direction, I think, to take into account these, especially the social factors. I think some of the technology, for instance, have already been taken account, but others, uh, and it's, I think that's, that's a great way forward in this literature. And, and I think IEMs can do provide some, some, some input to this literature um, to, to, to answer some questions of just transition. So thanks a lot. Let's give a, a round of applause to the speakers again.